back to Art Life. This week we're talking about artists and history and their pets. I'm Jessie. I've been a full-time artist for 10 years and thought it about time I start sharing my painting techniques and adventures. Subscribe to join me every week for a window into my art life. So over the past few weeks, you may know that um, I got a puppy. This is Finn, the miniature schnauzer. And the main reason that my studio time is now split between painting and just playing with this little guy. Um, but in the episode where we uh, find Finn and we bring him back to the studio, I think it's called Studio Puppy. Check it out if you haven't seen it um, over here. We asked the question, would this be an interesting episode? Artists and their pets in history, you know, famous artists, what kind of eccentric pets have they had? Maybe there's some stories about animals in art and history. Um, and a lot of you gave us comments and we have listened to you and have decided to make this episode of Artists in History and Their Pets. So yeah, here it is. So before I go too much into particular artists in history and their pets, I thought it would be good to just touch on in history in general, the way artists have depicted animals in the animal kingdom. The oldest reference I could find was 19,000 years ago. Cave art in France was seen to have depicted 600 different individual references in daily life. In uh, Babylonia in uh, 3500 BC, there's lots of depictions of goats and horses, um, which is insane. That's so long ago, pre-ancient Egyptian. Um, obviously, when you think of ancient Egypt, the mind immediately goes to the fact that they worshipped cats. Like literally these guys were obsessed with cats. They would mummify cats. Um, they would pray to cats. There were literally uh, temples devoted to cats and, you know, the goddess of the cat, uh, Bast, Basset, um, head of a cat. Anubis, they worshipped canines as if they were um, intermediaries between this world and the afterlife. So Anubis had the head of a jackal. Um, other Egyptian gods, Horus, head of the falcon. I think their awareness of the animal kingdom kind of like traversed between our world and the world beyond, which is quite interesting. If we skip ahead to 800 BC, we can see how the ancient Greeks started to worship uh, the animals that they had in their homes on pottery and mosaics. There's so much evidence of how like dogs particularly started to be really revered. And it was also, um, a kind of ancient Roman tradition to start to see dogs as loyal, as kind of symbols of loyalty. There's a really interesting article that I'm going to post at the bottom of this video that just talks about how man, man and dog, the canine symbolism in art and how like dogs could represent status and loyalty um, politically as well uh, in art, not just as a well-loved pet. So that's quite interesting and please read that if you're interested. Um, I think the Renaissance turns, particularly dogs, I mean, because of my dog, I'm going to talk about dogs a bit now, but um, the Renaissance saw the representation of sort of pet dogs in portraits as a symbol of status and loyalty. A lot often women, high-born women royalty were shown um, holding dogs on their laps uh, to sort of show status. Um, I imagine it'd be really nice to as well pose with your pet on your lap sleeping. I think it probably made the time go quicker if you're sitting for a portrait for many hours. Um, one thing that really stood out for me with Renaissance painting was Titian, because obviously since the 16th century, people have been painting like pet portraits officially. Um, but Titian painted the Venus of Urbino, um, the kind of nude courtesan, um, like master painting, uh, very lovely, very, beautiful, beautiful nude. And actually it's probably something we could talk about, the nude in art, really interesting subject, particularly when you couple her with Manet's Olympia, whole other topic, I digress. Um, but at the base of the courtesan's feet is a sleeping dog. So rather than the dog being a symbol of loyalty, wide awake, it's sleeping, which is because a dog is about fidelity and looking at a painting like that in the Renaissance of a famous Venetian courtesan, the last thing um, you're going to be thinking about is fidelity. One thing I love about researching artists and their obsessions with animals is to sort of see how um, 
sometimes it can filtrate into their work. So Da Vinci, for example, um, who was obsessed with the mechanics of flight, um, the art historian Vasari said that he loved um, freedom, the freedom of birds and the movement of birds so much. And he relied on watching nature to give him inspiration and his work constantly sought the proportions of nature um, that he would go to the market to buy birds in cages, take them home just to free them and see them fly and let them be free and in the wild again, which I thought was very romantic of him. In the 1700s, Asian art also saw a rise of uh, fashionable um, interest in the art scene uh, in depicting animals, particularly dogs. Although he's not a painter, a story that always stuck with me um, about a creative and their love of animals was Lord Byron, the poet, um, who I think actually requested to be buried next to his dog Boatswain because um, he loved him so much. Um, but when he was at Trinity College in Oxbridge, he was really upset that no animals, no dogs were allowed on campus. So he found a loophole, which meant that um, he brought a tame bear into university uh, and obviously no fellow could tell him to send him home because there was no rule about bringing tame bears into university. And I think as a joke, he tried to even say he should maybe enroll as a fellow here or a student here, not just as a pet, because there was no rule to say that bears couldn't uh, train uh, to be academics. Um, and I think Byron did a lot of that kind of stuff because um, he had a, apparently, uh, for the scoundrel that he was, a great love of animals and a great soft side with when it came to animals. Um, Finn taking part in the art history research of artists and their pets by eating the research. Helpful. I know Kandinsky and Paul Klee um, were in love with their cats. I remember that there was something I read years ago that Paul Klee had a cat that would walk through his watercolour pieces and make marks with the watercolours and one of his friends was like what are you doing you, you're you know his cats anyone who's ever had a cat they love to be they love to sit on where you are they love to just be on your laptop be on your drawing be on your homework it's it's yeah cats like to just be exactly where you don't want them to be but Clee's cat um walked through his watercolour puddle and started walking across making marks on his artwork and he said um, to his friend, years from now, art connoisseurs will wonder what, how that mark was made. What is that mark? Um, and he, he never changed it. He didn't mind that his cat literally just walked through his work like, this is rubbish. Like, yeah, the true art critic. <laughs> um, but more than just dogs and cats, I think talking about an artist who had a menagerie um, and was so influenced by her pets, um, of course, I'm talking about Frida Kahlo. Anyone who's seen some of her paintings where she depicts, you know, her birds around her, like the way she uses animal almost as part of her prints, part of her designs in her painting. Um, she didn't know just have sort of birds and dogs. She had two spider monkeys. Hang on, I have their names. They were Fulang Chang and Kamito de Gairabal. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but that's not the research as well, that's my handwriting. Um, um, she had parrots, she had eagles, she had a fawn. Yeah, so she had loads of pets, but she was obviously in a pain. Frida Kahlo had so much kind of pain. She had a lot of back pain because she was in a car accident as a young uh, young girl. She was also in pain because she was married to this sort of slightly scumbag, Diego Rivera, who was sort of known to, they, they used to argue a lot. And I think he, cheated on her quite a lot so I think she was often struggling with her relationship and her animals were her solace um so yeah the way she kind of describes pictorially um her menagerie her, her sort of like spirit guides of her animals they gave her so much comfort and so much support in her practice and you can see the way she represents that in her painting um and, and some photography of her that's taken with her monkeys yeah, I mean, can you imagine having a monkey? Oh, actually, no, I can imagine a monkey would be a nightmare in a studio, the way they'd go for your paintbrushes. Um, any research, by the way, that I have done, I will try and put all of the links to articles and books I kind of found on the subject at the bottom of the video uh, if anyone wants to do any more research on their own. And if I've missed anything, I'm sure I have. I know a lot of people were commenting on, um, like, famous artists and their pets that they knew about in some of the videos before. Um, yeah, if there's anything I've missed, do let me know because it's quite an interesting, eccentric subject. Um, I think the most interesting, someone said a comment about 
Dali in one of the videos um, and I looked into it and he had two dwarf leopards called Booba and Babur um, and Dali obviously being that surrealist, strange, you know, eccentric individual that he was would take his two dwarf leopards around with him. He was in a cafe apparently and a woman screamed like, "What? why have you got wild animals in the cafe? And he was like, Madame, I'm in art design. That's what he said. <laughs> Go Dali. Thinking about cats in particular, I found a really good article on, I think it's Art Gorgeous, I'll put the link below, um, that referred to the Japanese artist um, Fujita, who had 20, the most successful book on cats ever published. I think he does 20 etchings of cats. Um, and they're very iconic, you'll know, you'll know it when you see it. Um, but he, said something really interesting. I want to get this right. So in 1935, he said that ladies are alluring, um, but unless they surround themselves with cats and learn from them, their potential beauty will never be realised unless they understand themselves through the way cats um, conduct themselves, I guess. Um, so yeah, dating advice, look at the way cats are, I guess, and it could help you with your romantic life. According to him, that is. Um, Ai Weiwei has, I think, 30 cats, and I think in Beijing at the moment he has a cat sanctuary. Um, he just basically often says it's all about the cats when it comes to his life. Um, and he's an activist, like, he does so much um, in the world, politically in general, and for him it's all about the cats, though, at the end of the day. Um, Murakami as well, he's insta-famous with his uh, dog Pom. Like, Instagram, again, is a really good way to uh, share our obsessions with our pets, particularly if you're a famous artist and, and you're just, just like you're snapping away pictures of your drawing and your art, you're kind of snapping away at the picture of your dog. Um, yeah, literally. How could you not just want to take photos of that cuteness? So talking about birds, Matisse uh, in the 1940s loved cats, but also loved doves. And he was famously, um, known for feeding them all brioche buns in the morning. He also had a friend in the 1940s, Pablo Picasso, who also loved the form of the dove and then created his dove peace symbol painting. Um, I think Matisse then gave him the doves in a symbol of like friendship. And also he was so inspired by how it had inspired Picasso that Picasso got a couple of doves as well from Matisse. Um, yeah. Picasso, oh my gosh, Picasso. So Picasso had famously the longest love affair of his life, wasn't with a woman, it was with his dachshund called Lump. He was apparently a real rascal, but this dachshund was the only creature allowed into Picasso's studio ever. Um, he also had his own handmade Picasso plate. Um, can you imagine being served your dinner on a Picasso painted plate? And also his favourite chew toy was one of Picasso's bunny sculptures. So he literally got his own Picasso sculpture to have as a toy. Um, and he was so in love with this dog. Again, famous, the famous uh, line drawing that Picasso did of the, of the Dachshund. He appears in Las Meninas, Picasso's painting. Um, Picasso was in love with this dog and actually he was alive for 16 years, which is insane for a dog. Um, and then they died within 10 days of each other. So Picasso's true love wasn't a woman, it was a dachshund. Yeah, there are some strange stories about eccentrics with their pets. Andy Warhol had 25 cats in his studio and he called them all Sam. I mean, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it, it would save kind of losing losing names, just call them all Sam. Again, so the list is going on. Uh, David Hockney had 40 individual paintings of his two Dachshunds, Stanley and uh, Bodgy. Um, Lucian Freud and his dog Pluto, there's a, that amazing uh, picture of Pluto, um, which I just love. He said that he loved about the Whippets, their lack of, I think it was their lack of arrogance and their animal pragmatism. Um, also that he was really comfortable in his nakedness, which kind of makes me feel like he was talking about human characteristics that he wished that we adopted more, um, things he liked about the Whippet that he wished maybe society had more in themselves. Um, I mean, he again suffered a lot with depression and he often said how Pluto uh, just supported him emotionally in his sort of, not just his studio practice, but in his life. 
Um, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, the, you know, the mother of US modernism, had two chows, um, particularly later on in her career when she was painting a lot less uh, due to her health reasons. Her, you know, her chows were her life. They were her like rock, her emotional crutch, her, you know, that support. Um, so the list is going on and on and on about artists, eccentric characters in history, creatives and their pets and how their pets have supported their studio practice or uh, inspired their painting or just helped them emotionally if they've been going through something in their lives. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now, but I know there's so many, you know, more stories that I've missed and articles that uh, maybe I didn't quite catch. And if you find them, if this subject inspires you and you want to run with it, do let me know in the comments below if you, you know, hear of any more cool stories about artists and their pets. Um, yeah, art life is quite solitary in that an artist studio practice, you're, you're alone in a studio with your own thoughts, your own kind of um, projects. Uh, yeah, it's quite solitary and having a pet just be with you all day. Um, there is something like pretty awesome about that. So I think reading all of these articles and research about artists and their pets has only confirmed that getting Finn um, was the right decision. So I hope you found that episode interesting about artists and their pets in history. I know I did. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. You can follow me on Instagram at Jess Oliver Art. In the week I'm posting lots of stories about what I'm doing. If yeah, you can't wait until next Monday. So until then, I will see you next week. Bye.